Hello citizens of the internet, today, I am going to discuss ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy remains a dramatic gynecological emergency, as well as a persistent diagnostic challenge. Ectopic pregnancy is an abnormal pregnancy in which the developing blastocyst becomes implanted at a site other than the endometrium of the uterine cavity. The most common extrauterine location is the fallopian tube, which accounts for 96% of all ectopic gestations. Ectopic pregnancy coexisting with intrauterine pregnancy is called heterotopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy accounts for 0.25 to 1% of all pregnancies. With increasing use of artificial reproductive technology and the rise in incidence of pelvic inflammatory disease, the incidence of ectopic pregnancy has increased in recent years. Rarely, pregnancy can occur both in the uterine cavity as well as fallopian tube or other ectopic sites. This is called heterotopic pregnancy. Its incidence is 1 in 17,000 to 30,000. Although the incidence of ectopic pregnancy may be rising, the mortality associated with this obstetrics emergency has fallen dramatically, thanks to newer more definite methods of diagnosis that are available today. Location-wise, ectopic pregnancies are basically of two types, tubal or non-tubal pregnancies. This diagram taken from my textbook Modern Obstetrics shows the various sites where ectopic pregnancy can occur. Tubal ectopic pregnancies account for 96% of the cases, and in the fallopian tube, the commonest site is ampullary portion of tube. The rarest type is abdominal pregnancy which can be primary or secondary abdominal. Secondary abdominal pregnancy occurs when after rupture of tubal ectopic pregnancy, the gestational sac gets implanted on intraperitoneal structure such as omentum and parietal peritoneum and continues to grow. High risk factors for causation of ectopic pregnancy are as follows. The risk of repeat ectopic pregnancy in patients with a prior ectopic gestation is approximately 3 to 8 fold higher. In vitro fertilization has been associated with an increased risk of both tubal ectopic and heterotopic pregnancy. Greater the number of embryos transferred, higher the risk of ectopic pregnancy. The incidence of ectopic pregnancy is approximately 2 to 3 fold higher in patients with infertility although this could reflect the increased incidence of tubal abnormality in this group of patients. Intrauterine device Women using an intrauterine device have a lower incidence of ectopic pregnancy than non-contracepting patients because the intrauterine device is a highly effective method of contraception. Among IUD users with contraceptive failure, the risk of ectopic pregnancy is high. Similarly, estrogen slash progestin oral contraceptives are highly effective and the overall risk of ectopic pregnancy is low, since conception is prevented. However, in patients who do become pregnant while on these contraceptives, the risk of ectopic pregnancy appears to be increased 2 to 5-fold compared with other pregnant patients. Sir TNA Jeffcott explained that, external that is transperitoneal or internal migration of the fertilized ovum to the contralateral fallopian tube can lead to ectopic pregnancy. This animation made by me illustrates this. This long journey leads to advanced development of the ovum so that it becomes ready for implantation when it reaches the contralateral tube. This can be proved by presence of the corpus luteum in the contralateral ovary which is seen in 50% of ectopic pregnancies. Fetus is malformed in majority of cases, and disaster overtakes the pregnancy usually before it is six weeks old. If left untreated, an ectopic pregnancy in the fallopian tube can progress to a tubal abortion or tubal rupture, or it may regress spontaneously. Tubal rupture is usually associated with profound hemorrhage, which can be fatal if surgery is not performed expeditiously to remove the ectopic gestation. Ruptured ectopic pregnancy is the major cause of pregnancy-related maternal mortality in the first trimester. Most of these deaths occur prior to hospitalization or proximate to the patient's arrival in the emergency department. Tubal abortion refers to expulsion of the products of conception through the fimbria. 
This can be followed by resorption of the tissue or by reimplantation of the trophoblasts in the abdominal cavity, known as abdominal pregnancy, or on the ovary, known as ovarian pregnancy. Tubal abortion may be accompanied by severe intra-abdominal bleeding, necessitating surgical intervention, or by minimal bleeding, which would not require further treatment. Spontaneous resolution of an ectopic pregnancy can occur, although it is difficult to predict which patients will experience uncomplicated spontaneous resolution. Clinical manifestations of ectopic pregnancy typically appear 6 to 8 weeks after the last normal menstrual period but may occur later, especially if the pregnancy is at an extrauterine site other than the fallopian tube. There are three types of clinical presentations, rupture, with resultant massive intraperitoneal hemorrhage leads to acute presentation. It is an obstetric emergency. Chronic presentation which is the commonest type, is due to small but recurrent intraperitoneal bleeding resulting from tubal abortion or mole. Rarely chronic leaking ectopic pregnancy may later rupture and produce acute symptoms. This is called subacute presentation. The time of appearance of three important symptoms vis-a-vis, -vis, amenorrhea, lower abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding helps us to differentiate ectopic pregnancy from spontaneous miscarriage. In ectopic pregnancy, the characteristic order is, variable period of amenorrhea followed by lower abdominal pain and lastly vaginal bleeding. In spontaneous miscarriage, vaginal bleeding precedes abdominal pain as a symptom. No bleeding pattern is pathonomic for ectopic pregnancy. Some patients may misinterpret bleeding as normal menses and may not realize they are pregnant prior to developing symptoms associated with ectopic pregnancy. This is particularly true in patients who have irregular menses or who do not keep track of menstrual cycles. As far as lower abdominal pain goes, there is no pain pattern that is pathognomonic for ectopic pregnancy. Pain is usually located in the pelvis and may be diffuse or localized to one side. Pain tends to present between 5 and 7 weeks of gestation as the fallopian tube becomes sufficiently distended. Patients may describe their pain as continuous or intermittent, dull or sharp, or mild or severe. Tubal rupture may be associated with an abrupt onset of severe pain. In cases in which there is intraperitoneal blood that reaches the upper abdomen or in rare cases of abdominal pregnancy, the pain may be in the middle or upper abdomen. If there is sufficient intra-abdominal bleeding to reach the diaphragm, referred pain may be felt in the shoulder. Blood pooling in the posterior cul-de-sac, pouch of Douglas, may cause an urge to defecate. Features of acute presentation are short period of amenorrhea absent in 20 percent there may be history of infertility prior to the amenorrhea pain is of sudden onset and is severely agonizing or lancinating it may be referred pain to the shoulder syncopal or fainting attacks are common vaginal bleeding may appear later due to sudden hormone withdrawal per abdominal examination may show distension extreme tenderness in the lower abdomen rigidity and signs of free fluid in the abdomen, if there is massive hemorrhage. On speculum examination, vagina is pale and tender, cervix has bluish discoloration as shown in the picture. On bimanual examination cervical movements are tender, cervix is soft. Uterus is of normal size, it is soft. A fluctuating tender fullness may be felt in the pouch of Douglas. Soft, Tender mass may be felt in one or both fornices, this is either tubal ectopic mass or mass of pelvic inflammatory disease or both. There are certain signs which if present in a woman of reproductive age, point directly towards the diagnosis of acute ruptured ectopic pregnancy. These are Severe pallor Extreme pallor of face Palms and vaginal mucosa in a woman of reproductive age group suggests ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Danforth, sign. Shoulder pain on inspiration suggests massive intraperitoneal hemorrhage. Bladder sign. Sudden urge to empty her bladder, she collapses before or on reaching the toilet. 
Cullen's sign, bluish discoloration around umbilicus due to massive hemoperitoneum. This is not so visible in dark-skinned Southeast Asian women. Features of chronic presentation which is characteristic of unruptured leaking tubal ectopic pregnancy are short period of amenorrhea, pain, there are different kinds of pain in ectopic, constant dull pain, due to distension and tearing of tube, cramping pain, due to peristalsis and dilatation of tube, soreness and tenderness of abdomen, due to peritoneal irritation by blood, sharp pain, due to movement of cervix on the uterus. Signs on bimanual examination are either normal findings or unilateral or bilateral adnexal mass. The differential diagnosis of bleeding with or without pain early in pregnancy includes physiologic, for example, implantation bleeding, spontaneous miscarriage, cervical, vaginal, or uterine pathology, for example, cervical polyp, subchorionic hematoma, gestational trophoblastic disease, as far as diagnosis by pelvic ultrasonography goes, differential diagnoses are corpus luteum cyst and pelvic inflammatory disease. In modern obstetrics, definite diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy is possible with use of modalities like serial beta-HCG estimation, focused pelvic ultrasonography, and of course laparoscopy. Before I discuss them in detail in next couple of slides, let me point out that, in the pre-ultrasound and laparoscopy era, the diagnosis was purely clinical and therefore it was made only after rupture of ectopic pregnancy. This is also the reason why maternal mortality was high, then. Urine pregnancy tests are positive in only 50-60% to 60 of ectopic pregnancy and hence not recommended. Detection of beta-HCG in the serum by ELISA or RIA is more sensitive, if the test is negative, normal and abnormal pregnancy including ectopic are excluded. If the test is positive, ultrasonography is indicated. Detection of beta-HCG in the serum by ELISA or RIA is more sensitive. If the test is negative, normal and abnormal pregnancy including ectopic are excluded. If the test is positive, ultrasonography is indicated. Doubling time known as CATR principle. In normal pregnancy, the beta-HCG level doubles every 48 hours during the first 42 days of gestation. Ectopic pregnancy usually shows less than 66% increase in beta-HCG level within 48 hours. Unfortunately, this is not specific to ectopic pregnancy. In 15% of normal pregnancies as well as in abortions there is also slow doubling time. Serum HCG is measured serially, every 48 hours, to determine whether the change is consistent with a normal or an abnormal pregnancy. A single HCG measurement alone cannot confirm the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy or intrauterine pregnancy. Please note, the same laboratory should be used for serial measurements since HCG results vary across different assays and laboratories. In general, HCG levels in normal early intrauterine pregnancies will rise by at least 35% every two days. The actual rate of rise is dependent on the initial HCG level. An HCG that rises less than 35% every two days across three different measurements is most consistent with an abnormal pregnancy, for example, ectopic pregnancy, non-viable intrauterine pregnancy. An HCG concentration that plateaus or decreases is most consistent with a failed pregnancy, for example, arrested pregnancy, tubal abortion, spontaneously resolving ectopic pregnancy, and complete or incomplete abortion. In modern obstetrics, the gold standard for diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy is pelvic ultrasonography using high-resolution machines which are now quite ubiquitous. In a suspected case, the sonologist should perform a structured, focused ultrasound evaluation of pelvis. First do a transabdominal and then a gentle transvaginal sonography, the tip of the TV probe should be 3 to 4 centimeters from the external OS. First look at the uterine cavity in endometrium for presence or absence of intrauterine pregnancy, 
Then turn attention to adnexal regions. If diagnosis is confirmed, measure the size of the mass and look for free fluid in pouch of Douglas and entire peritoneal cavity. Following findings suggest diagnosis of mainly tubal ectopic gestation. Nonspecific signs are solid, cystic, or complex adnexal mass adjacent to a slightly enlarged uterus, absence of an intrauterine sac, and free fluid, blood, in the cul-de-sac. Specific signs, rarely a fetal pole with cardiac activity, or yolk sac, may be seen outside the uterus or characteristic ring pattern, referred to as bagel sign, may be seen. In next few slides I will show you actual ultrasonography plates. Since the absence of intrauterine pregnancy is key to diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy, first look at the endometrial cavity. Diagnostic clues are Absence of double decidual sac sign Pseudosac sign may be present in 10-20% to patients. This is centrally located fluid collection in endometrial cavity as seen in this transvaginal sonography picture on the right. Please note, it is quite common to find normal endometrium in a case of ectopic pregnancy as seen in the plate on the left. This focused transvaginal sonography shows a hydrosalpinx. The enlarged fallopian tube is caused by bleeding in the tubal walled and lumen and not from products of conception. If present, measurement of the ectopic mass size is important because the management depends on the size. Maximum diameter and not average diameter should be measured. This should also include blood clots. Lastly, the sonologist must measure the amount of free fluid, which is actually blood. These two ultrasound plates show free fluid, the one on left shows small amounts in cul-de-sac. The right plate, done using linear probe, shows fluid, that is blood, in between loops of small intestine. Caveat, free fluid in pouch of Douglas is not exclusive to diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy, it can be present in other conditions like miscarriage, ovulation, pelvic infection and retrograde menstruation. Before I sign off about role of ultrasonography in ectopic pregnancy diagnosis, I want to sound a note of caution. Ultrasound modality is ideal for a case of chronic presentation or clinical ectopic pregnancy is suspected, but there are many other differential diagnoses. But if it is a clear-cut case of acute ruptured ectopic pregnancy with free fluid in abdomen, don't waste time confirming the diagnosis, send her to operation theater right away instead of ultrasound department and prepare for emergency surgery. Color Doppler may be applied after ultrasound examination. Placental perfusion seen characteristically as ring of fire pattern and high velocity low impedance flow pattern seen outside the uterine cavity and the finding of cold uterine cavity with respect to blood flow is diagnostic of ectopic pregnancy. However it should only be done by a sonologist well experienced in color Doppler. Corpus luteum cyst is an important differential diagnosis of ring of fire sign. Discriminatory zone is the serum HCG level above which a gestational sac should be seen when an intrauterine pregnancy is present. For transvaginal ultrasound examination, a discriminatory zone of 1,500 milli international units per ml is used. However, discriminatory zone vary by laboratory and institution, and some institutions set the discriminatory zone at 2,000 milli international units per ml. For transabdominal ultrasound, the discriminatory zone is higher, approximately 6,500 milli international units per ml. It is important to emphasize that a patient should not be diagnosed or treated for an ectopic pregnancy based on a single serum HCG level. This animated table shows rate of rise of serum beta HCG in normal intrauterine pregnancy depending on on the sampling interval in days. Pay attention to second row. When the sampling is done at intervals of 48 hours the rate of rise is 66% which roughly means beta-HCG doubles every 48 hours in a normal pregnancy. This was first studied and reported by Catter, hence it is referred to as Catter principle. This is why, in clinical practice, we repeat beta-HCG every two days. In modern obstetrics, 
the most important investigation for confirming the diagnosis is of course laparoscopy, which is diagnostic as well as therapeutic. Distended hemorrhagic tube, leaking of blood via fimbrial end or blood in cul-de-sac suggests ectopic pregnancy as seen in the laparoscopy picture on right. Advantages of laparoscopy are Definite diagnosis A concurrent route to treat N A direct route to inject chemotherapeutic agents into the ectopic sac A serum progesterone level 25 nanogram per mil virtually excludes ectopic pregnancy with 97.5% sensitivity In most cases, however, serum progesterone levels are between 5 to 25 nanogram per mil which are considered inconclusive Values below 5 nanogram per mil indicate intrauterine pregnancy with dead fetus or ectopic pregnancy. Hence the predictive value of a low serum progesterone for identifying non-viable pregnancies varies with the patient population. Serum progesterone level estimation has no role in diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy. There are some pregnancy-specific substances produced by the normal decidua of an intrauterine pregnancy which would not be produced in ectopic pregnancy. Their measurement can be used as an additional aid in diagnosis. Progesterone-dependent endometrial protein PP, 14 values are markedly decreased in ectopic pregnancy. Pregnancy-associated plasma protein A, PAP A synthesis is severely and selectively compromised in ectopic pregnancy. Pregnancy-specific beta-1 glycoprotein, SP1, active in A levels are the lowest in ectopic pregnancy and significantly lower than those in spontaneous miscarriage. Diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy in pre-ultrasound and pre-hormonal tests era involved following obsolete investigations. Cul-de-centesis, historically, cul-de-centesis was used to detect blood in the posterior cul-de-sac, however, this finding can be easily demonstrated with transvaginal ultrasound. Blood in the posterior cul-de-sac may be from bleeding from an unruptured or ruptured tubal pregnancy, but it may also be the result of a ruptured ovarian or corpus luteum cyst. Therefore, a cul-de-centesis positive for blood is non-diagnostic. Uterine aspiration the intrauterine location of a pregnancy is diagnosed with certainty if trophoblastic tissue is obtained by uterine curatage. Of course, the use of curatage as a diagnostic tool is limited by the potential for disruption of a viable pregnancy. Moreover, the sensitivity of curatage in finding chorionic villi is only 70%. PIPL endometrial biopsy is even less sensitive than curatage for detection of villi, sensitivities reported in two small series were 30 and 60 percent. If curatage is performed, serum HCG levels can be followed post-curettage if histopathology does not confirm the clinical impression. When an intrauterine pregnancy has been evacuated, HCG levels should drop by at least 15 percent the day after evacuation. Some have recommended performing aspiration only on patients with both an HCG concentration below the discriminatory zone and a low doubling rate. Approximately 30% of these patients have a non-viable intrauterine gestation, and the remainder have an ectopic pregnancy. Knowing the results of aspiration avoids unnecessary methotrexate treatment of the 30% of patients without ectopic pregnancy. The positive predictive value is high if chorionic villi are found. This is the end of part 1 of my e-lecture on ectopic pregnancy. The link to part 2 that deals with management is given in the description box below. If you want to know more about this topic or any other topic in obstetrics and gynecology, please refer to my books Modern Gynecology, Modern Obstetrics and Practical Obstetrics and Gynecology and other books. The links are given below. They are available on Amazon.in. For purchase inquiries, contact me on this WhatsApp number. I have also published two question answer books which are particularly useful for exam going students. These are Clinical Cases in Obstetrics thousand plus questions and answers and clinical cases in gynecology thousand plus questions and answers 
these are also available on amazon.in you can also follow me on other social media platforms like facebook and instagram the links are given here if you enjoyed this video hit the like button share it with your friends and also subscribe to my channel for more videos like this thank you for watching